Hello, my name is Blair Frodelius. I've been a member of the International Wizard of Oz Club since 1977. And today I'm going to read for you a selection from Oziana magazine from 1988 entitled A Side View of the Nonestic Islands by Timothy Perper and Martha Cornog. The jet engines purred with well-tuned military harmony. They were near the middle of a flight from somewhere in Asia to somewhere in the States, testing a mighty fancy piece of equipment. Phil was bored, as he usually was on long missions. He put down a technical manual on photonic transistors. The Army took a dim view of recreational reading on such flights, especially what Phil liked to read. He glanced at Ark. How's the gadget? Working. Ark was not the talkative type. Is it on now? I'm bored. Turn it on and let's see what we get. Ark looked at his machine, the first and only computer-enhanced top topographic and underwater scanner, Cetus for short, like the whale. The finest and newest side-seeing radar in the world, able to resolve whales barely surfaced on the sea as they dove down to 15 fathoms. The idea was that it would be useful for following submarines, but it could also see a single bone of a whale on the beach, or so they said. So far, on its first test flight, Cetus had seen some fishing boats, but no whales. Yeah, agreed Ark, maybe we'll find us a whale. His hands moved over the console, turning the dials and setting switches. Let's use natural color he said, suddenly wanting to talk, and set it for 50 kilometers, plus and minus some. Yeah, let's look at the Pacific. The monitor glowed briefly and began to generate the rainbow used for selecting the color enhancement. Arc turned the hue adjustment to natural and activated the scanners. The monitor displayed some pink speckles and spots as it focused on the deep sea blue of the Pacific. Just like it ought to be, Ark observed. Yeah, no whales. He turned a dial and the blue came closer, resolving itself into waves. He adjusted more dials and some residual pink speckles vanished. Then Ark pressed record. The screen displayed the time and the aircraft's location, and they settled in to watch for whales. After a while, Phil decided that photonic transistors were very interesting compared to blue waves. The screen registered a new color. Ark sat up. What's that? He demanded, increasing the gain. Looks like an island. Nah, ain't no land out here. It's got bugs in it. The false island vanished. But soon, another replaced it, larger, and then another. Ark stared at the screen. His precious machine was acting up. Now the screen was showing the solid colors of the landscape, a large landscape. Interested again, Phil watched the dunes of a tan-gray desert pass by. Then the colors changed, and everything suddenly turned bright yellow. A mountain, some rivers, all were shades of yellow. Damn, growled Ark. It's gone buggy. The color colors shifted to violet. Ark was too competent to readjust the settings. He knew that the repair personnel would now need all the information they could get. Briefly, the land turned blue. Then it became desert yellow, or so Phil insisted. After a while, the screen showed water, more smile islands, and finally the blue waves of the Pacific. There it stayed until they reached the U.S. coast, and Ark turned Cetus off. As they were landing, Ark pulled out the tapes, packed them up, and as soon as they had taxied to a stop, he was off the plane. These go to Lieutenant Jurgens," he called back. Catch you later. Yeah, Phil said, later. In an hour, the tapes were on Brigadier General Mark Culpepper's desk with a handwritten memo from Cetus Technical that either Cetus had blown an electronic gasket or it was picking up a floating platform, obviously some kind of military installation, where either we or they had put it. And what should we do next, sir? Damn, thought General Culpepper. Those fools had been ordered to test Cetus, but over land, in Asia, not over the Pacific. His irritation grew. This dishevelment was typical of the whole blasted project, he said to himself. Although, he added, 
turning the memo over several times, increasing it into a squarish shape. Things seemed to be unraveling more than usual. But still, he continued, defending himself stoutly against anyone who imagined that he ran a slack shop, you can't tether the creative spirit too far. And Cetus Technical was creative. After all, they had designed Cetus, hadn't they? He glared at the memo again. Held at the right angle, it looked vaguely like a fish. Dishevelment, he said aloud. Why can't they do it right? Cetus had been turned on, and now either we or they had this, quote, platform where no platform ought to be. Damn, he repeated. Well, it looks like some delicate information gathering is called for. I think I'll call John Smith over at Acme Development. He reached for the phone and turned on the voice scrambler. Give me John Smith, he finally told the telephone. This is Culpepper at Walters Air Force Base. As regular Army, it galled him to work from an Air Force base, even if the Air Force and the Army were theoretically cooperating on the CETUS project. Well, he thought, maybe if CETUS went operational, then the Army would have first crack at it. Yes, John Smith, he told the telephone again. John Smith of the Dives. He waited. The memo had started to look like a whale, so he threw it into a corner of the office. John was an old friend, and many years ago they had gone through military academy together. But John had quit the military to take a far more important job, or so he claimed, with the company, with the completely unofficial but very real division of Esoterica. Dives, pronounced div-s by those in the know, but there weren't many in the know. It wasn't really a division either, just a loose conglomeration of people interested in all sorts of things natural and otherwise, like water sprites, love potions, elementals, and monsters. No more crackpot than Cetus, the general thought, and just as real. Sometimes he envied Smith, though all he really knew about dives was that over the years they had gathered a trove of arcane information, perhaps even about multicolored platforms floating in the Pacific. Hi, Johnny, Brigadier General Culpepper said after a while. This here's Culp. How's your golf? Culp chewed his lip as he listened. Handicap you five, the general finally rejoined jovially. I've got new clubs. He listened again. Great. Tomorrow it is, down here at Walters. Early start. The, crowds course, the course crowds up after 9.30. Oh, you know the Air Force. He hung up. The general distrusted scramblers, but the message had gotten across. John knew he wanted some information. He spent the evening chewing his lip to his wife's quiet concern. Her husband had put many a good, a good many career eggs into Cetus, and Hilda knew he was worried. But she didn't ask any more when she heard that he was playing golf with John. She knew the two men liked each other. The following day was good golf weather, clear, cool, and not too breezy. But the general was still worried. Either Cetus had bugs, and that's no way to go with a device that expensive installed on a small but equally expensive aircraft, or there was an unknown military installation in the middle of the Pacific. As he waited for Smith, the general realized that he didn't really know which he wanted to be true. But Smith had always been prompt. At exactly 0930, he walked into the officers' club. New clubs, Johnny, Culp said, patting his golf bag. The tapes were in the bottom. Hope to see them, replied Smith, his gray eyes twinkling. Let's play. At the sand trap near the fifth hole, the general stopped and took out the tapes. Smith silently put them in his golf bag. From the first and maybe the only Cetus test, Culpepper said, the tech people think that some subcontractor put in a couple of reject circuit boards. It sees things that aren't there. Like what? Smith asked quietly. Martians? The general grinned. He remembered that Dives had once spent four months tracking down some lunatic radio man on a destroyer escort who believed that he could speak to the little blue men from Mars. Not little green men, if you please. They had identified themselves to the hapless radio man as blue spherical creatures with tentacles. Finally, Smith had gotten across to the radio equipment, but only after someone had, quote, repaired it. And, of course, it no longer communicated with the blue spherical Martians. No, Culpepper answered. 
It sees a non-existent platform in the middle of the Pacific. That is, unless it exists, and... Smith continued the thought, and then we want to know who put it there and why, especially why. True enough, but let's keep going, because otherwise Masterman will want to play through. We surely don't want that, Smith said. Go on, there's your ball. And he pointed to the ball sitting in the sand. Brigadier General Culpepper finally blasted it out, ultimately to lose the game, but he didn't mind too much. Cetus was worth a game of golf. The next day, Smith was watching the tapes for the fifth time, or maybe the tenth. Islands, water, islands, normally colored land, then yellow mountains, violet forests, cultivated farmland, but bright blue. More water, islands, than the Pacific again. Needless to say, no map of the Pacific showed anything of the sort. But even so, he felt a childhood memory at the edge of his mind. A family tale about a 19th century smith, an ancestor of some sort, an artist, an inventor who had gone to the South Seas to open a machine shop. But the 20th century Smith shook his head to clear it. He couldn't place the story or explain why it was linked so strongly with this multicolored platform. He put the memory aside. It's an odd sort of platform, Smith mused, but let's see. And he reached for the telephone. Some dozen calls later, he was sure that we had no huge multicolored platform floating in the Pacific. Of course, that left them. So he picked up the phone again. Billy, how are you? Smith here, over at Acme Development. Say, we got a question. Billy was an old, well, one must suppose that colleague is the right word. People in Billy's line of work don't have friends, especially since Billy worked for, um, shall we say, two employers. I was talking to an old sea captain the other day, Smith began. You know, an old-time whaling captain. He smiled at Billy's comment. Yes, whales can be hard to see, except when they surface. Again, a pause. Well, this old sea dog says that there's a big island down in the Pacific, a real tropical paradise, blue trees, yellow mountains. Wonder if you know that old sea story. Smith tapped his pencil while Billy answered. Billy's information channels weren't infinite, but Smith had hopes. No, you say? Smith echoed. That's a new one on you? Well, you know, these old sea dogs spin some fancy tales, but every now and then... Billy promised to call back if he could track down this bit of seagoing mythology. Oh well, Smith thought, picking up the phone again. I give up. May as well bring out the big guns. I'll ring, a, ring up Fred Holm. It was a short call. Walter Fredholm, dean of Missatonic University in Arkham, Massachusetts, and host for an extremely successful conference on sorceries, so successful that they still didn't know where all of the registrants had come from, vouchsafed from the description that perhaps, just barely perhaps, he might possibly know someone who knew about the old sea story, but he'd have to see the map. No map? Smith agreed that a map would be produced from the tapes. Billy called back. He had never heard of the old sea dog's tale, and his informants frankly thought that it was made up, like talking to green spherical Martians. They were blue, Smith corrected him. There were a few secrets among those who knew about dives. He felt disappointed, but now that he knew they hadn't built the platform, there was growing in him the curious interest which came from sensing the unknown close by. Psychologically, Smith was a combination of Sherlock Holmes, he belonged to the Baker Street Irregulars, and Acme paid for his membership as a business expense, and the purest romantic. He had hoped that the radio man was talking to blue spherical Martians. Okay, back to Culp for the map, he said to himself and picked up the phone again. The general also had information. They had sent Cetus out once more, controls left unchanged. Ark once again on the flight. Bill, too, even his manual on photonic transistors, just like the first time. Who knows? Maybe static electricity from the manual had done in Cetus. And they flew the same coordinates over the empty Pacific four or five times, taking endless film of endless blue waves, just to prove that there was no yellow and violet platform where Cetus saw it. Cetus performed magnificently, the same colors, the same islands. Whatever the circuit board was doing wrong, it did it wrong the same way each time. 
Cetus registered variations in non-existent topography perfectly, sometimes red forests, pretty violet-covered farms, a bright blue mountain range, now a bit of green, or maybe the floating platform changed a little each time, because Cetus certainly thought it was mapping something. Ark glared at the Cetus control panel and declared it was sick. Ain't nothing out there, he insisted to anyone who would listen. When they brought the tapes back to Walter's Air Force Base, the general first ordered a map. No problem, sir, said Lieutenant Jurgens. No problem. While the general waited, by now really quite worried, the phone rang again. No scrambler, just the smooth voice of Admiral Whitby. Understand that you're seeing colored whales, Culp, purred the admiral. Damn, thought the general. No, Admiral, no colored whales. Cetus is undergoing differential color adjustment tests, and we're looking at how aircraft static affects its gain enhancement circuitry. You know, radionic tunneling. Dat hogwash out of snow him, he thought. Sure, sure, Culp, old boy, boomed the Admiral. Well, you army boys are having a whale of a time, eh? Let me know if you see any yellow submarines, okay, Culp? And he hung up. Damn, thought the general, and damn the grapevine too. Whitby is an old geezer, he added to himself. Should have been retired years ago. Jurgens came in with the map, new and clean from the multicolored computer printer. Real pretty, thought the general in disgust. You can read the message real clear. Cetus is one sunk whale. But he called Smith anyway, and surprisingly, Smith would send a courier to pick up the map. Immediately, Smith added, the plane will be at Walters in 95 minutes. Sometimes the general wondered where Smith got his pull. Though Acme seemed to be just a tool and die manufacturer, it also seemed to have a lot of money. And so did dives. Either way, the general thought, it's no simple matter to send a plane for just a lousy map. Although Cetus deserves as much, he thought proudly, as if Cetus were the child that he and Hilda never had. But there it was. He couldn't worry about it. He went to meet the plane. When the jet landed, he was startled. The courier was Smith. The general dashed out, pleased but anxious. I'll get the back, map back as soon as possible, Smith assured him. There's more to this than you think. They haven't beached Cetus yet, not by a long shot, but I'm off. He ran back to the plane and it roared away. General Culpepper stood on the runway, still pleased, less anxious, but even more confused. Hours later, the plane landed at Boston's Logan Airport. Smith dashed to a smaller aircraft with Air Force insignia, and off it went towards Arkham. Dean Fredholm met the plane in his old green Pontiac. As they drove towards the Mis Miskatonic campus, he chatted to Smith about this and that, as if he hardly cared that Smith had just flown 3,000 miles carrying a map of a multicolored military platform floating in the Pacific for some totally unknown reason. He pointed out how lovely the foliage looked now that fall was here. Yes, New England was beautiful, wasn't it? Then he re reminisced about his conference on the Necromicon by the mad Arab sorcerer Abdul al-Hazred and speculated about some of the, well, odder guests. Smith, he recalled fondly, had provided some funds for that conference via dives, hadn't he? As they drove through the campus, Fred Holm waved at several students, Bright kids, he commented cheerfully. Finally, they reached Fred Holmes' office with its manual typewriter and piles of papers and books. Smith pushed them aside and unfolded the map. Ah, yes, said Fred Holm. Ah, yes, exactly so. Smith was tired. Ah, yes, exactly what so. I gave your description of the map to an expert informant, someone out in Michigan, as it happens, Fred Holm began, but I'm forgetting my manners. Let us have a drink. He opened a cabinet labeled Miskatonic University Presidential Committees and took out a bottle of scotch. He poured two glasses and lifted his to Smith. Here's to the Nanestic Islands, he said. Smith drank thoughtfully for a moment. Then he laughed. Of course, Smith and Tinker. And just for that, you can get me back to the airport now. Then finishing his drink, he paused. No, I'll have another. He offered his glass to Fred Holm. By all means, Fred Holm refilled it. I assumed you'd like to make some calls. Feel free. Then he chuckled. Smith and Tinker, eh? Early pioneers in automation and lunar travel, as I recall. 
a relative? Not precisely with modern techniques, but yes, there are family ties. You know, I never really thought Cetus would find me a relative. Fredholm smiled, nodding. You must tell me your family's version of that story someday, but not right now. Use the phone. I'll join you later. I have a meeting with the president of the university, and I'll need this. He tossed off the scotch and, still smiling, left the office while Smith reached for the phone. Culpepper called a staff meeting for the very next day. He even invited Admiral Whitby. Have some news about whales, Admiral, he told him breezily. The Admiral was no fool. He agreed to come. He'd even brought his attache, Ensign Peters. The General was not particularly surprised when Smith also flew in the next day. Smith was looking tired but happy, happier than the General had seen him in many years. He was glad that Smith was there. Always a good idea to have well-informed friends. At 1300, they assembled around the long mahogany conference table. Admiral Whitby sat near the head with Ensign Peters next to him. A very young man, looking hardly more than 17, thought the general sourly. Major Collins from Cetus Technical was there, too, with Lieutenant Juergens. They had even invited Ark and Phil. Gentlemen, began the general. They looked at him with mixed emotions. Ark figured that this was the preliminary to some kind of hearing where he'd get it for turning on Cetus over the Pacific. Admiral Whitby waited for a chance to defend the Navy against Army interlopers, but Smith's gray eyes twinkled. As you know, last week during a routine test of Cetus, and the general looked at Ark and Phil, who visibly relaxed, certain signals were registered that seemed to suggest that perhaps we had detected a large platform in the Pacific. For feeding whales, interrupted Admiral Whitby. No, Admiral, continued the general, but a platform that might, we believed, have military significance, especially since it was colored with unusual patterns. Such patterns could be coded signals, perhaps, for an ocean-based landing platform to be seen by radar from space. Obviously, a matter of great interest security-wise, particularly if the platform were not part of our defense efforts. In the meantime, unfortunately, some loose talk got started, and in the name of national security, it is a wise course to settle those rumors and the general looked at Admiral Whitby. Go on, Whitby grunted. Yes, continued the general. From expert sources, we have not only identified the platform with an already named structure, but have also had it indicated to us that its presence is not a threat to our military security. Whitby cocked an eyebrow. Your source, he snapped. Smith cut in before the general could answer. It should be... It should not be further identified. Let me only say that the source is quite high in the present administration. Whitby glared momentarily, but abandoned the idea of asking either who Smith or the source was. Is that so? He said finally, glowering at Ensign Peters. The Ensign smiled uncertainly. Is that so, General? Whitby repeated. And the name of this already identified structure, this platform in the Pacific Ocean, or is that something the Navy doesn't have to know? The Nanestic Islands, said General Culpepper. The ensign's eyes flew open, and he leaned forward, looking at the general. Nanestic, sir? He said. Yes, Peters, that's what the man said, snapped Whitby. Peter's eyes widened even more, but he said nothing. This high administration source, continued the general, has indicated that it would be unwise to attempt to gather further information about these islands, either by us or by any other service. The admiral glowered again, this time at Culpepper. It is not usual, he began, slowly putting his fingertips together, for an army man to tell naval personnel their business. But Smith interrupted. Quite so, admiral, quite so, but... Since I myself sought administration opinion concerning this structure, do you want my credentials, Admiral? The Admiral brushed his offer aside. I assure you, Smith continued smoothly, that this source is high enough in administration to make its desires operational in all the services. According to this source, there is no question that the present administration endorses a long-standing policy which countermands all missions to the Nonestic Islands. Smith's eyes seemed gray indeed. So we're to be content with a name only, the Admiral said, looking at Smith, 
Ensign Peters started to speak, but stopped himself. Smith leaned forward, turning to General Culpepper. A map was made. Against any doubt, it identifies these islands. Slowly, he began to unfold the map as Ensign Peters watched. Curiously, the Nonestic Islands do not seem to be visible in ordinary light, but they give excellent radio, radio and radar images. That is why Cetus could see them. He turned to Major Collins and his staff from Cetus Technical. A remarkable machine. Despite your doubts, it worked perfectly. The general smiled proudly. He'd never really doubted it, he told himself. He glanced at Ark, who was so relieved that he actually smiled, and then at Major Collins. Good men, he thought with pleasure. The major nodded knowledgeably. They're probably using a photonic distortion screen, he stated a bit pompously. It doesn't work against radio or radar. Admiral Whitby shifted in his seat, stopping Major Collins in mid-sentence. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> if the device does prove useful, it will certainly be of interest to the Navy. Thank you, sir, Smith replied. Your support for the CETUS project is most welcome. Then he turned to Major Collins. And doubtless, Major, the Nonestic Islands do have some highly developed technologies. He smiled at a memory and finished unfolding the map. Ensign Peter's eyes were riveted on it. General Culpepper coughed. <clears throat> Accordingly, I now anticipate that we can start the final operational, operationalization phase of CETUS immediately, he announced with obvious relish. However, these administration orders are clear. There will be no further missions to the Nonestic Islands. Admiral Whitby glanced at Culpepper. Then his gaze, too, was drawn to the map. Its computer-drawn edges faded, and for a moment it became the ocean itself, encircled by the immense curve that is the horizon. Then, like the fading edges of the map, that curve also receded, widened, opened, and sometimes when the horizon recedes, there are islands like jewels in a brilliant sea, the islands of childhood. Slowly, the admirable nodded. Yes, Smith, he said. Yes, you are right. We can no longer sail there. But, sir, burst out Ensign Peters, his eyes focused on a green spot in the middle of the map. That means we'll never get to visit Dorothy and Trot and the Sawhorse. Peters, snapped Admiral Whitby. Peters fell silent. Yes, that's so, said Smith, almost sadly and began to fold up the map. Then his eyes twinkled. But now we know they're there, don't we? The Admiral nodded again. For a moment, he and Smith looked at each other, and as their eyes met, the two men smiled. But Ensign Peters did not see them. He was still looking at the map. And somewhere in the Nonestic Islands, a yellow, straw-filled hand reached out and flipped off the switch on the terminal of the magic picture. The company in Ozma's chamber looked at each other in relief. Well, that's that, said the wizard. The end. Thanks for listening.